Hi there, and welcome to Telefunkian. Today, we're going to be taking a look at our vintage Roland TR606 analog drum machine. This drum machine isn't working, and as the title slide might suggest, we're going to be fixing the power supply. We'll show you how we diagnose this problem, and we'll set about rebuilding the power supply and getting the 606 working as good as new. The information in today's video is going to be applicable not only to a TR-606, but a TB-303, which shares the same power supply configuration, a RE-606 or a RE-303, and some of the 303 and 606 clones all share a similar power supply design. So without further ado, let's get started. Today on the bench, we have a Roland TR-606 vintage analog drum machine. And this drum machine is billed as not working. And uh, that's all we know is that it is apparently not working. And so we're going to uh, pull this thing apart and start to poke around and uh, figure out what's wrong and fix it. So um, one of the first things that we're going to do is attempt to power it up. Uh, I have a uh, an adapter here, which is plugged into AC right now. And this is one that I use and have used um, for many years to power uh, Roland instruments such as TB303s and 606s and the like. And just to confirm, uh, and it's a good idea to do this, just make sure that you have the correct polarity on your power supply. And we're looking at about 9.7 volts here. And you can see that the polarity of the power supply is such that the negative is on the inside or the, the tip, if you will, or the core of this barrel connector. And the outside is positive. So when I measure the uh, voltage of this power supply, I get uh, about 9.7. See how wide that is varying? That's kind of shocking. Time to get a new power supply. There we go, 9.7 volts. Uh, it's just corrosion on the on the tip. 9.7-ish volts on the power supply and the correct polarity. And we'll plug this in, turn the power switch, and the power switch is indeed on, and we see nothing light up. So we'll unplug that right away. Uh, we'll make a couple of uh, very quick inspections. And aside from the fact that this is kind of dusty and dirty, it doesn't appear to have suffered too much, if any, damage. Uh, one of the things we want to inspect when we look at any instrument like this that has the potential for battery power is we want to examine the battery compartment for any signs of leakage. And while we're in there, we can see that this is uh, serial number 2000, uh, 2000. Um, it's actually 208,600 is the, the serial number that is on the little sticker on the inside of the instrument here. I'm not sure if you can read that. Uh, but what that tells us, <clears throat> why that's relevant, is that there are some different versions of the circuit uh, that was used in this instrument. And so we know that this is a later version of the instrument, so it's not going to have one of the earliest uh, circuits in it. And so we can use that in our diagnosis. So the way to get this thing apart, and we can see it's missing a screw, which suggests that maybe somebody has been in here before. So we take out these screws, the ones that are deeply embedded. You want to use a hand tool here because these screws are uh, self-tappers going into plastic. We don't want to use any extraordinary torque here, otherwise we're going to strip that plastic. And cases for 606s and 303s are essentially unobtainable. Make sure we use the right size of screwdriver so we're not stripping these screws. And as the uh, case of the instrument comes away, we have two battery connectors, uh, which need to either be desoldered or simply just removed from where they meet the chassis. This one has been glued in a little. And again, other than a little bit of battery uh, acid, potentially, not, not battery acid, glue. Uh, I don't see any battery acid. So any evidence so far of uh, damage from the battery. 
set this aside. We take these off as well, these two screws that hold down the battery tray. Because this tray holds down one of the circuit boards. And we'll save all of these screws in a bag. We'll label. And I'm writing number two here because I have two 606s I'm working on at the moment. So pull this guy out. The knobs do not have to come off to remove the instrument from the chassis, uh, obviously. And again, other than a little dirt and some residual glue from the assembly and a little bit of overspray from the paint. Um, I don't see anything like evidence of smoke or flames or anything. What I do see is I see a little crack in the corner of the case right here. And this is classic. These, uh, the way these cases are made is they have a very thin piece of plastic around the surround where the two bits meet. Uh, and there's a, there's a corresponding thin element here on the bottom of the case, but on the top, it folds over this internal element on the bottom of the case. And this is where these cases crack and break. So we'll put a little drop of crazy glue in there to make sure that this part of the case, which if we press on there, it's wiggling a little bit because it's cracked. We don't want that to break off. We don't want to lose that. So what do we see? We see this hasn't, um, doesn't appear to have had a lot of work done to it. We see a couple of things. We see these uh, little dust covers are still present, which is good. Uh, oftentimes they'll be removed during servicing and uh, we should expect to see these here, the dust covers covering the switches and the um, these two potentiometers. Again, these are filthy uh, and we'll clean all of these later. Um, what else do we see? We see that these plastic standoffs, which hold the individual or rather the subboards. This is the switchboard and then this is the so-called subboard. Um, and then the main board, three boards comprising the 606. We see that these plastic standoffs are intact, which is a good sign because very often what will happen is that during servicing, people will break these, um, attempting to take the instrument apart. And the way we take the instrument apart, because we're going to need to in order to do some probing around the circuitry and also want to do a thorough inspection is we gently compress these fittings until they release the board, these standoffs. And again, gentle is the word and they should just sort of pop right off. We don't want to be too rigorous with this board because amongst other things, this thin ribbon cable is prone to uh, cracking, breaking, and then sometimes you have connectivity issues that will manifest and affect your ability to use the instrument. This um, dust cover is hiding a slot, uh, a slot in the PCB that um, this switch needs to come through, see? Uh, that slot will allow the switch assembly to, or to, uh, or the switch board rather, to move forward once we free it from the standoffs. There we go, and it's a little snug. It's determined to take the switch with it. We can take the, the switch uh, cover off, uh, but I'll do that later. By moving all of this forward gently and making sure we're not pulling on any wires that might be trapped. We can gain access to the board below and we'll do the same thing with the other PCB, except first we'll remove or attempt to remove these knobs. And they should pull straight off unless they've been inadvertently rammed on in the incorrect orientation. You can see these are knurled shafts and the knobs themselves are knurled as well. But if you uh, try to ram these knobs on when they're slightly out of orientation, what you'll do is uh, distort the plastic and then the knob becomes almost impossible to get off. And in particular, um, the knob on the rotary switches can be a bit of a bear. 
is the tempo potentiometer. And the on off volume switch. There we go. I'll take these dust covers off and see that they've been doing their job. And again, we just gently squeeze these until they release the, the board. Then we can lift it up and get access to the components underneath. And of course, there are quite a few components underneath. So if we examine the board, we'll be able to determine whether or not there's been any soldering done here. And I will spend a few moments doing that. So after a, a quick inspection of uh, of the board, I'm, I've come to the conclusion that there has, there has likely been some work done on this board uh, and maybe not terribly well. And there are two areas uh, of main concern. So in the first case, because we have nothing happening when we uh, turn on the power, of course, the power supply itself, the power supply section of the board is uh, potentially a source of some concern and that is this area here and it includes of course the jack and then there's a couple of transistors involved uh resistors capacitors and importantly this transformer here and this transformer is kind of a a, a piece of unobtainium um it's made out of unobtainium meaning that if this transformer is bad this guy here, we're going to have a really hard time finding a replacement. Uh, and the reason why I suspect there may have been some work done here is that there's big, huge blobs of solder here uh, where there shouldn't be. The soldering should be uh, a little bit more restrained, uh, meaning it should look like the rest of the board. And then there's another area uh, that gives me some concern, and that is uh, this portion of the board over here, where we see a big, huge, hairy blob of solder that I'm pretty sure could not have come from the factory. And then over here, we see what appears to be a, a torn or ripped trace. And um, I'll need to uh, get my um, schematic to refresh my recollection as to what this is all about. Um, but it's over here near the tempo uh, and the, the uh, in sync portion of the circuitry. Um, so we'll see what that might be. But that power supply section is the number one candidate for uh, very close inspection. And so what I'll do is uh, evaluate some of these components as best as I can in circuit and then maybe reapply some power and see what's happening uh, in the power supply section of the board. I'm also going to uh, quickly grab another 606 so that we can have a look at it and compare. So here's another 606. And this 606 is one that I have uh, worked on reasonably extensively, completely recapped it and uh, just made sure that everything was working as it should. And again, just by way of reference, um, we can look at and compare some of the uh, the soldering on the on the boards and this is the type of soldering that you would expect to see in a power supply from the factory uh, right there and this is the analogous section on this board showing that it has indeed been worked on um, and then again if we compare this section of the board here which is all nice and neat and we see the traces are perfectly intact uh, we can see that this is uh, this is really a mess, and it, sh it shouldn't be. And we'll try and fix this up and figure out what the heck is going on. Um, so yeah, somebody has worked on this, and they haven't done a particularly neat and tidy job. Uh, but we can sort this out. It's a bit of a shame. Um, they're not well. They're not making any of these original 606s, so we want to make sure that we can do what we can to keep this one working properly set that aside. And because we have a 606 that is working, we can, for example, uh, apply power to it and take some measurements and uh, see what the various voltages should be on the board and then compare them to what the voltages are on this instrument. And uh, that 
should assist us in our diagnosis of the problem, as should the schematic. And so we have the schematics uh, in a lovely picture. It might seem funny, but this actually comes in handy when you go to uh, start evaluating the instrument and you've taken the cover off, which has all the labels for all the knobs and you forget which is which. Having a picture of the actual instrument uh, can come in handy. In terms of schematics. We'll pause here for a moment just to acknowledge that although the schematic for the power supply section of the instrument is available in the service manual for the TR-606. It's embedded amongst uh, quite a bit of other circuitry and it is rather difficult to read. So to address this, I've redrawn the schematic and made it available through a download link on my website. I've also included the names of the replacement transistors which differ from those that were used in the original instrument but are now of course unavailable. You'll recall as well that on a previous occasion I had described the recapping of a TR-606 in another video on the channel and you may want to refer to that video which will include more information about the capacitors we'll be using to rebuild the power supply in this instrument. Uh, there's really two pages of schematics. There's one that includes the switchboard, uh, which as the name implies has all the switches on it, but it also includes the tempo functions and the um, microprocessor, the, the uh, NEC650 and the memory sections. And uh, then you go to the second page of the schematic and we're looking at the main board and the so-called sub board, which has some of the circuitry for the toms on it, as well as the headphone amplifier. And so uh, when it comes to the actual power supply, however, um, the, the main, uh, power supply is detailed on this uh, second page of the schematics and it describes the power that comes into the instrument which is this DC uh, more or less nominally 9 volt supply which is then processed into a positive 6 volt supply a positive 15 volt supply by virtue of this uh, transformer and then a positive 5 volt supply and all of this circuitry here is suspect at the moment because it appears that we're not getting these supplies. So we'll examine the instrument and uh, figure out if any of these are working and be right back. After examining this board, we've determined there's a couple of components that appear to be damaged. In particular, there's a transistor here, Q41, which is shorted. There's a uh, emitter to collector short here. This is the emitter, collector, and the base of the transistor. And there's an emitter collector short there. And another component which is not functioning as it should is the 2.7 ohm fusible resistor R237, which is from this point here to this point here. And that should be uh, giving us a 2.7 ohm reading, and it's not. And that's this component right here. It appears as if this transistor has shorted, and then this fusible resistor has fused as it should. And um, the, a question we might have is why? And there are a number of components that can fail in this power supply, amongst them a number of electrolytic capacitors, which we'll examine. Um, but I'm not sure that it was actually a failure in any of the electrolytic capacitors. And the reason why I'm not sure is because if I examine this transistor here, and it's the power transistor, Q42. And if I wiggle it ever so slightly, you can see that these pins move. I hope you can see that. And these three solder joints are uh, need to be refreshed. They've cracked. So why have they cracked? Well, nobody is wiggling this transistor back and forth as the instrument is being played in its case, but rather this transistor, which is quite famous for getting very hot, it's gotten hot, cooled off, gotten hot, cooled off several times. And as a result, these traces have cracked. Why has it gotten hot? Well, again, that could uh, relate to other components on the board elsewhere on the board. Um, but we'll 
find out in due course. In the meantime, what I'm going to do is replace this transistor, bridge this re fusible resistor, because I don't have one at the moment, and replace uh, the electrolytic capacitors that are in the power supply. Um, I could simply resolder this transistor and replace this one and see what happens, but I'd rather just rebuild this whole thing and make sure that it's all working properly. We could also have leaky diodes. There's some center diodes in this power supply that could be responsible for um, the failures, but uh, again, we'll pull the components and find out how they're performing out of circuit. First things first. Let's get this uh, transistor out of there. Okay, this is this transistor that appears to be shorted, the B647. Let's, uh, we'll put this guy in our little $20 transistor tester and see what happens. Yes, and so it's showing up essentially as two resistors. And so this transistor is definitely dead. And we'll pull the resistor as well. So here's our 2.7 ohm fusible resistor, old micron <coughs> fusible resistor. Again, we can use our little component tester to see what it says about this guy. No unknown or damaged part. Yeah, I would agree. We'll pull this wobbly transistor. Well, the transistor appears to be intact, showing up as a PMP transistor. Um, yeah, HFE of 140. Yeah, that's a bit more like it. So this will be our replacement. So we'll check the remaining diodes, D38, D39, D41, uh, just with the uh, diode checking function of my multimeter. And we'll also confirm that D44 and D45 are performing properly, assuming we can find them. And then we'll repopulate and see what happens. D45 is way over here and D41 are way over near the uh, clock section of the PCB, which has been messed with, keep in mind. So we're going to be examining this to uh, determine whether or not it needs a bit more attention. So let's check these guys the diode function. So, um, it's D41 has a voltage drop of 6.1 volts and an overload in the opposite direction, which is what we want. Uh, 38 and 39 appear to be functioning properly. These are the ones that um, keep the uh, battery from draining, uh, yet provide backup power to the memory. D44 is over here and has a positive, has a voltage drop of 0.63 volts, overload in the opposite direction, and D41. Okay, that was D44. 45 is simply, D45 is yeah, D45 is right in there. Here we go. And 0.566 seems a little low. 0.566. I think I might be replacing D45. Oh, 0.624. How did that happen? Hmm. 
So although the power supply section on the printed circuit board is over in this corner here towards the back right hand side of the instrument, there is another capacitor that is involved in the power supply regulation or filtering, which is C9, which is responsible in part for filtering the plus five volt power supply. It's located way over here near, near the uh, selector switch. And uh, this uh, part of the power supply has relatively weak filtering and I like to replace this and upgrade it with a larger capacitor. So I will uh, pull that and um, be right back. So where is this located? It is this guy right here, which is nominally a 10 microfarad at a 16 volt. Um, but I'm not sure that that's what's in there right now. Um, so we'll pull what is in there out and go from there. It's right here, I believe. It's not best practice to use your soldering iron as a shovel. So there's C9 and oh, will you look at that? C9 has been uh, upgraded to a 100 microfarad capacitor at six volts, which is uh, curious because that's not what uh, is called for in the schematic. So somebody has already replaced this. Let's see if it's behaving properly. Okay, 3.8% loss. Let's see if we can do better than that. Alrighty, gosh, look at this mess. What were they thinking? Okay, so let's uh, clean this board up a little bit and um, start repopulating it and see if we can get the power supply working again. Just as a last uh, step before I do that though, I'm going to check all the resistors. Make sure that we have no shorts uh, or anything of that nature, um, that they're all still within specification. And this is a lot easier to do when we have uh, when we have some of the semiconductors and capacitors out of the board. So first things first, this guy, brown, green, red, 1.5k, perfect. Brown, green, red, 1.4, 1.5k, perfect. Brown, black, yellow, 100k, perfect. Um, that was R236. And yeah, it's supposed to be 100k, and this is 3.2k, and this is R234, 3.3k, 3.2k, that's good enough, R233, and that's supposed to be 33 ohms, and it is. Um, what else do we have? R239, should be 27k. Oh. Let's just click here, R239. It's supposed to be 27K and it's 16K. How could that be? R240, it's supposed to be 82K, but it's in parallel with a 15K, so it's certainly not gonna be 82K. And R244 is again gonna be 10.5. Okay, R242, it's supposed to be 27K. And it is 17.2, 242, what? R243 is gone. Why is R243 gone? It's supposed to be 180K. Here's one I prepared earlier. And we're also missing um, one of these resistors. We have R242, um, but no R243. R242 is measuring 16.6K. So the first transistor we're going to replace is this guy here, which is uh, uh, <coughs> Q42. And it's supposed to be a 2SB586, and we're replacing it with a TIP30, which is uh, uh, a perfectly reasonable substitute. We're going to solder it a little proud of the circuit board, and that should be fine. We need to make sure there's plenty of room there for it. And there is my kingdom for an alligator clip. Here we go. Okay. 
It's a little hard to heat up the pad when they're on the other side of the transistor. There we are. And if I wiggle this or attempt to wiggle the transistor, there's no movement whatsoever there, which is what we want, of course. Um, so we'll cut these legs. Another thing we need to do is because we don't currently have a fusible resistor here, um, I'm going to put in a, uh, a jumper here. And this is, will be temporary until such time as I get uh, some of these fusible resistors in. I'm not a big fan of uh, removing them all together. Um, the RE-303 and the RE-606 projects, which are uh, replicas of the 303 and the 606, which share very, very similar uh, power supply designs. They recommend in their build instructions that you just uh, jumper this resistor or put a jumper in place of this resistor. And I'm really not a huge fan of that. Um, why would you ever want to do that? This is something that's there to protect the rest of the instrument and some of the parts that could be affected by overcurrent uh, include this little Sumida transformer, which is not easy to find a replacement for. So we'll put this jumper in just to facilitate our diagnosis and repair. But in the meantime, I've got some of these on order. Okay. Now, what about Q41? And that is our uh, 2SB647C. And we're going to replace that with a different uh, transistor. And where are we? Yes, so we're replacing the 2SB647C with a, a, a KSA 916 YTA, um, which is also, of course, a PMP. And before we do this, I'm just going to uh, double check on the data sheet for this transistor and make sure that the pinouts on this match the pinouts of the transistor that we're replacing. And once I've done that, I'll pop it in. So the uh, pinouts on this transistor are identical to the one that we're replacing, which is good to know. <clears throat> it's actually more than good to know. It's essential that we know this. It's essential that we understand the pinout configuration so that uh, we know the transistor is going to function. So I shouldn't be quite so sort of flippant about it. It's much more than good to know. It's something we need to know. These guys. It's a very odd solder join here. So another transistor we're replacing is Q44, which is a 2SD667. And uh, we're replacing that with a KSD1616, which is, again, a suitable replacement. And I've confirmed that the pinout for this transistor is the same as the one that uh, is being replaced. So transistor Q44, is located uh, adjacent to the transformer. It's right here. And try and uh, get the leads in. You splay them slightly. They need to be separated just slightly more than they are. Why don't we do this? We know that they go right here. We pulled out our Zener diodes and we want to uh, replace those as well. And we have a 6.8 volt Zener. 
right here to replace D40. And D40, where is D40 again? There it is. It's up here uh, behind our power transistor. And we have to be mindful of the polarity, of course. But again, we'll uh, use this. It goes right here. We'll use the back side of the board to bend the leads. And D42 is our 15 volt zener. And got one right here. And this is placed right here, um, more or less along the uh, same line as the as the uh, potentiometer um, lugs. And again, we have to be mindful of the orientation. Make sure the stripe is in the correct place. So that's really it for semiconductors uh, that we've pulled out of the power supply. And all we have left now is the various capacitors, the electrolytics that need to be replaced. And I'll uh, collect these and, uh, and um, be ready to proceed. So we're replacing the capacitors. We'll start with uh, C. Gosh, which one will we start with? We'll start with C105. And that is a 10 microfarad capacitor. And the one that was in here is a 50 volt, uh, sorry, a 16 volt capacitor. And uh, it is on the six volt rail. And uh, we're going to be replacing it with a, a capacitor that is newer, but also is rated to 50 volts and 105 degrees. And so we insert it in the correct location, which is right here, uh, making sure that the long leg is on the positive side and the negative is towards the outside of the board, C105. Uh, the next capacitor is going to be similarly a 10 microfarad. And so this one will be C103 and we're replacing it with uh, similarly a 10 microfarad at 50 volts. These are Rubicon XYF series, which are great for power supplies and the like. So 103 is right up here. Uh, and again, long lead in the positive side. C104 is next, and that's a 100 microfarad capacitor. And we happen to have one here, a 100 at 16 volts, uh, which is probably adequate, but I will save this for uh, a different location. And I'm going to use a slightly higher grade capacitor, although this is not, this is formally a audio capacitor. It will be fine in this uh, location. And the reason I'm installing this one here is that it's rated to 25 volts, not 16 volts. And accordingly, it should be a little bit more robust. And C104 is right here. Uh, C101. C101 is a 2.2 at 50. And it. This is it. This is a 2.2 uh, at 50. And where are we? C101 is down here. And C100 is 47 microfarads at 16 volts. And we have a 47 at 50 in the form of this uh, Nichicon KA series, which again is a uh, audio grade capacitor, but it'll be fine in this location, C100. Okay. Now, 
lest we forget, um, we also have C9, which is our uh, filter capacitor for the 5 volt supply. And you may recall that we had a larger capacitor than was indicated in that position and we're putting a larger one back in, in place and so we're using a 100 microfarad at 16 volt and this uh, capacitor's function is to filter the 5 volt power supply rail and it goes uh, it goes right adjacent to this slider switch which is located here okay a couple solder blobs floating around the board here we want to make sure that they're not floating around the board because they could short something out so that's that capacitor um, and i'll just inspect this and make sure that uh, nothing is shorting the capacitor bodies aren't touching anything they shouldn't be touching and so on and that I haven't missed anything that uh, I am indeed fully repopulating the board. And I think that is the case. There is one other thing, and that is capacitor uh, C102. So C102 is a, gosh, where is it? C102 is a one nanofarad uh, capacitor, and it is located uh, right here, it's one of these little green guys. And they are really not particularly prone to failure. Uh, however, given that pretty much everything else in the power supply is being replaced except for the resistors, I'm inclined to replace C102 as well, put in a really low ESR film capacitor. And in order to do that, I just need to make sure I know exactly where it is. And it is right here. So I will desolder C102. Uh, C102 is right here. That's right in here. Nothing could be easier, right? There we are. C102, let's just uh, check this in our little tester. See what it says. It says it's a 2000, and 2200, oh, yeah, a 22, a 2.2 uh, nanofarad capacitor instead of what's indicated in the schematic, which is a, a one nanofarad capacitor. And so let's see if I've got a 2.2. And it's not that this is reading high, it is that uh, this capacitor was swapped out at the factory for one with a larger uh, value. And we can confirm that by examining the writing on them, where this one says 2200, and this one says 222K. And so, again, these are equivalent. And uh, just in case we are really doubting ourselves, we'll test this one again, or test this one, and there we go. Uh, 2200 picofarads. So, um, again, the only reason I'm replacing this is because I know this is uh, a more reliable device than the one that was in there. Uh, it'll have a much higher rating and uh, it uh, will provide us with lots of good service for years to come, undoubtedly. So that is all of the capacitors replaced in the power supply, as well as um, the most important transistors and um, and the Zener diodes. So uh, it may be time to power this up and see if we're back in business. We'll power up the instrument and evaluate the uh, power supply with it on and um, hopefully not uh, let any of the magic smoke out. So what I've done here is I have connected a, a voltometer with a, a clip connected to ground, and uh, we have our power supply, which is plugged in, 
and I will plug it in. The instrument is turned on and I'm probing uh, 15 volts here. And indeed we have 15.73 volts. And if I probe positive six volts here on the Tom board, we have nothing. But that is because we haven't plugged in the headphone jack. The six volts that comes into the, into the sub board here uh, provides power to the headphone amp. And that is located, it's a, it's a chip which is located on, on the uh, subboard right here. It's a long, you can see its pins here and you may be able to actually see the chip. It's an LA4140 headphone amplifier chip and uh, it's getting its power. So that's great news. Uh, the positive five volts will be coming over to um, this other side of the board and we should be able to see it on the positive side of C9, which is this side. I'm going to see if I can get my uh, multimeter probe in there. And it's a little high at 5.6 volts, but either way, we've got, uh, we've got voltages where we need them. So that's some success. Now to see if the instrument is actually working. And in order to do that, I'll actually plug in some headphones and see if it makes sound. Well, I can say one thing for sure, and that is that this uh, potentiometer is a little scratchy. Well, we've repaired the power supply on the 606 and uh, I'm just going to walk it through some of its functionality and so that we can ensure that it's working properly. And we've got a, a little pattern programmed here. We're in the pattern write mode, so we can modify the pattern as we go. First of all, we're starting in the accent position. We have an accent on the one and the four, and we'll move to the kick drum, and we've got a kick on every quarter note in this last uh, the four end. You can hear the accent. Again on the four and the one. <clears throat> Got a snare here. We have some low toms and high toms. High tom is there. <clears throat> what'll happen if we program a high and a low tom on the same note. It gives a slightly, slightly different pitch. A cymbal. The cymbal can go very loud. And then hats. Open and closed.
So there we go. We have a fully functioning 606. We managed to repair the power supply and get this instrument working as good as new. Thanks very much for watching. Have a great day.